Hey guys, welcome to Harbor Church Online. My name is Allison. I'm here just to say hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us today and an, a special happy Mother's Day to all of you guys out there who are moms or grandmothers. We love you and we appreciate all that you do. If you are new here to Harbor, if you're just checking us out, maybe you have never even come to worship with us in person, but you're joining in online. We are so grateful that you're here and we wanna send you a gift just to say thanks and to say welcome to Harbor Online. It's a Duncan gift card, so it's not a big deal. There's no strings attached. We just want to give you a gift to say welcome. And so to get on that, um, click the link in the video description. We'll put it in the comments right now. Um, just click that link, go to the new here card, um, and we'll um, just give us some information. We'd love to connect with you and see how we can walk alongside you. All right, guys, we just kicked off a new um, round of connect groups. This round is a little bit shorter than we usually do, but it's just gonna, it's going to be just as impactful and intentional, um, connecting people with each other and with Jesus. And there is still time to get in on those groups. So there's um, a few offerings. Um, they're gonna be awesome. They already are awesome. They've just kicked off, so there's still time. Head over to our events page to check them out. That's it, you guys. We are heading into another week of the Sweet Spot series. This week, I have a feeling it's going to be really good. So make sure you got your notebook and your pen and your coffee ready to take notes and enjoy the service. That's it, you guys. Comment below. Let us know you're watching. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's get into it. What's up, Harbor Church? Come on, who's with me? Come on. I want to know that you're there, dude. I don't know if you got that, like singing that. Like God just kind of was like, hey, do you really believe this, Josh? And I'm like singing those worship songs. I'm like, that's, that, you, have, you have always been good, God. I haven't always been good, but you have, and you've been faithful. And man, it's, it's good to be reminded of that every once in a while. I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad for those of you that are tuning in online and watching that way, if it's on Facebook or YouTube or uh, podcast or whatever. My name's Josh. I'm the, the lead pastor at Harbor Church, and uh, I'm thrilled that we get to spend uh, this weekend together just jumping into another week on this series that we're calling Sweet Spot. And uh, it's, a, it's a little bit different because uh, it's a series on things that are polarizing, and uh, who doesn't like to talk about things that everybody disagrees on? And uh, the first couple weeks were a little bit different. Like I said, they're not all going to be the same. This week, uh, it's Mother's Day weekend, and uh, we're, it's, going to be the most, it's going to be the most specific topic that I do in this series. The other ones have been a little bit more vague, a little bit more general. They can apply to a lot of different areas. Um, and in the first couple of weeks, we talked about two things that were both good. In week number one, we talked about um, you know, having grace and truth. And grace is good and truth is good and you need both. And too often we go to one side or the other. And then last week, my brother Judson was able to preach for me. And he preached on the, uh, the idea of faith and works. And you want both faith and works. So both those weeks, where there are two good things. And often we just go to one and ignore the other. And the sweet spot was both. This week, I'm going to give you something bad and something bad. And neither of them are where you need to go. And often this is where most people end up. It's in one of these two Category. So for this weekend, we're going to talk about something a little bit different. I've only ever referenced it. I've never done an entire message on this, but I feel like I'm doing an injustice. Uh, I, I'm, I'm doing a disservice to the church to not hit on this topic and to, to speak on this because it is, it is incredibly heavy. It's incredibly important. Um, it'll probably hurt some feelings, but I want you to stay with me, all right? This weekend, we're going to talk about parenting how to pour into and raise children and, and, and help cultivate who it is that God has for them to be. Now, I need you to stay with me because some of you heard that and go, ah, this isn't for me. I don't have kids. Hold up. Hold up. There's some of you in this room that you don't have kids yet. And I recognize 
that you're like, I'm not thinking about that. But one day you you need you, you may need to know what your philosophy is on parenting. And I just got out of a conference and the pastor said this four or five times. He says, you don't want to wait until you're on the 10th floor of the children's hospital to figure out what it is you believe about God and your children. And I, I think a lot of times people step into parenthood without ever thinking about parenthood in the same way that a lot of people step into marriage without ever really thinking about what marriage is. Um, so it, use this as a, as a time going forward. I also recognize this is a tough weekend for a lot of people, um, especially if you're, if you're struggling through infertility. And if you're going, man, I'm, I'm not able to have children, and, and this weekend just, just brings that to the surface, and that's hard. And here's what I'd, I'd encourage you as well during a topic like this. What Satan wants to do is he wants to take this time where you're not, where you're not seeing what it is that you're praying for and you're hoping for, this, this infertility. He's taking that, and he wants that to be discouraging, and he wants that discouragement to turn into bitterness during this time. And here's what I would encourage you. Those of you that don't have kids yet, Why don't you use this time right now to say, God, how would you prepare me for parenthood? What is it that I need to to be thinking about? What is it I need to be doing? Whereas Satan would love for you to become bitter and angry right now, why don't you instead say, God, soften me so that I can be more aware and more ready to receive what, what blessings I believe that you're going to bring my way? Now, some of you heard it and you're like, my parenting days are behind me. This is not for me, but I will forward it to some other people I know. Your parenting days may be behind you, but what about your grandparenting days? They might still be coming. Or if you're John Petty, your great grandkids might be coming. I don't know. I mean, like the older you get, the more more, you you have there. Um, But I just said it because he's here and I was like poking him a little bit. But as a grandparent, you still get to have a huge influence on those grandkids, hopefully. And you might be able to help your kids avoid some of the mistakes that you made as a parent with them. So you can still help that way. And for the person here that's like, I ain't got kids, and I ain't going to have kids. This ain't for me. Hold, hold up, too. Do you remember the disciples interacting with Jesus? And Jesus is, is starting his ministry, and he's preaching, and he's teaching. And the disciples are like, get these kids out of here. These kids are not valuable to the ministry. They're just in the way. And Jesus says, oh, slow your roll. Bring the kids to me. These are the ones that represent the kingdom. Jesus saw the value in the future of the children. And he's the one that says, listen, if we're going to be a good church, we have to be... (laughs) We have to be willing to pour into the next generation. So even if you're here and you're like, I ain't got kids. If you're a part of a healthy community of a healthy church, you play a vital role in setting an example for all the kids that God allows us to have influence over. You help me pour into my kids. So as a parent, not even as the pastor, I I want you to take this message very seriously. You probably have friends that are parents or will be parents, and they may not know the godly plan that that is set for them in Scripture on how to parent the best way. You might be the person that God wants to hear this because you're going to be the person that helps them. And There's more application than I have time to get into, but don't tune it out because if, if nothing else, when we read God's Word and we see His outline for how to be a good parent... He is giving us an insight into who he is as our heavenly father. So even if you never have kids, if you understand when God says parents should do this and parents should do that and parents should do that, it's what he's doing for us because he looks at us as his children. He's like, this is how I care for you and this is how you should in turn care for others. And so we can learn from that if nothing else. Now, to remind you, The Bible says this in Psalms 127, verses 3 through 5. Children are a gift from the Lord, a reward from Him. They're a gift. Sometimes they don't feel like that, (laughs) but they are, you know. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hand. You don't want to go into battle with just one or two arrows. The more you got, the better. So he says, how joyful is a man whose quiver is full of them. And basically saying, hey, if you... If you have the means and you can steward your money well and you can afford 15 kids, go for it. <laughs> you know? I'm, I'm still trying to talk Kaylee into three, and she's like, yeah, good luck. <laughs> but it's, you know, that's up to you. But it, the Bible is basically saying, hey, this is, a, this is a good thing. Kids are a gift. Kids are a blessing. Yeah. All children are. We, are, we are. we live in a culture that does not agree with that. 
And it's not just your children are a blessing. It says all children. A child is a blessing. It's, it's all the kids. I, man, I, I love that we have a church that has senior citizens and newborns. Man, we should be diverse. We should have all the different ages represented. I don't want to go to a church where there is no kids or where there's no old people. I, I like the wisdom and I like the youth and the energy, man. We, we need both of that. But often you find that people just say, hey, this isn't good. Like, the, like Jesus' disciples, this isn't, isn't what it is. What I think we, we're, we're just really not seeing when it comes to this battle on parenting is we're, we're failing to see a master strategy from Satan. And it's the reason that I felt obligated to preach this this weekend. Satan has figured out how to use children and parents to screw up both. Now, I heard a story, and I couldn't, I couldn't verify it um, in the limited time of research I had, so I don't know for sure that this is true, but I heard a story uh, that the Germans were taught during the, real war, the, during the world wars and some of the battles to aim to injure the soldiers, not to kill them. Because they were told that they were outnumbered, and they said, if we can injure a soldier, take out his legs, shoot him in the gut, it will require two of his buddies to pick him up and carry him out. And so you get three soldiers out of the fight for the price of one bullet. And I feel like I heard that, and I was like, even if that's not true, I don't know, but I do think that's what Satan's doing. I think Satan absolutely is screwing up some parents by getting their child and screwing up some children by getting their parents. And he's taken three of them out in this one area. He's taken three people out. The amount of parents that I talk to who have no time for God, they have no peace in their life, they have no joy, they're stressed because something has gone on with their kids, it's, it's, it's mind-boggling. And Satan's laughing the whole way because that kid isn't serving God and those parents aren't serving God. And he's got, he's got a stranglehold on, on families and inside the church. And man, I'm... I'm concerned. I'm concerned for those of you that aren't parents yet that you're learning the wrong way from culture on how to do this. And listen, if you're here and you're a parent, this hurts. Because the more, I, the more I read, the more I was like, man, I got a lot of work to do. And so if I hurt your feelings, know that that's not the goal. The goal is to, is to help you see that, that you, you are very susceptible to one of Satan's best strategies for ruining the church, ruining God's mission, is to infiltrate the family. If you want to hear more about, a fam, about how families were supposed to be designed, go back and watch a series I did last year called Unordinary. And the very first week I did a, a, a service called The Unordinary Family. And how God, at the beginning of creation, designed it to look different than how the world is making the family look today. You can go check that out for yourself. Here's, what, here's where I think the polarizing options are in parenting today. The two things that are neither are good. The world is telling us we have to worship and idolize our children. And many parents do that. Their child is the single most important thing to them. And they pat themselves on the back because the world says, you're a good parent if your kid is the single most important thing in your life. And that's a lie from hell. And it actually makes you a worse parent because it's not the right way to do it. God's plan is better. But the world says, we will congratulate you for being a great parent if you worship your child. Now, the counter swing to that is the part of culture that says children are an inconvenience. And they should be ignored. They are a means to an end, perhaps, but mostly just an inconvenience. From the inconvenience side... This goes back in, in time for a, a long time. If you, if, if you look into about 4,000 years ago, the people that, that, that encamped in the area that we call Canaan, the Canaanites, they had a tradition of killing their children if they became inconvenient. And God actually warns against it. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 31, he says, You must not worship the Lord your God the way the other nations worship their gods. They they perform for their gods very detestable acts that the Lord hates. They even burn their sons and daughters as sacrifices to their gods. The most common god in the time that, that required child sacrifice was a god named Moloch. Baal also had human sacrifices, but Moloch was, a, was specially concerned with sacrificing infants. And they would heat the hands of this god up on fire, and then they would throw their children in. And they did it because back then, if the, you got to understand, back then, if, you, if you're heading into a time where crops may not be plentiful, 
Well, that kid's a liability now. Now it's another mouth to feed. It's another person you have to protect from raiders and bandits. And it's, it's another person that slows you down if you have to become nomadic, if you have to move these children. They're a liability and they're a cost and they're too much. And the, the pagans believed, I'll just sacrifice that child to this God and therefore the God will reward me with better crops and better fighting and, 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 uh, and whatever, whatever it is I'm praying for and it's a win-win for me. They sacrifice their children to the God of convenience, which is exactly what abortion is today. When this is not convenient for me in this moment, I can find a way to be done with it. The swing side of that very polarizing statement is, this child is everything to me and nothing is more important. The Bible says in Psalms 106 verse 35, instead, the people that were supposed to be following after God, they mingled among the pagans and they adopted those evil customs. They worshiped their idols, which led them to their downfall. They worshiped idols, which led them to their downfall. They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons. They shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and their daughters, by sacrificing them to the idols of Canaan. They polluted the land with murder. They defiled themselves by their evil deeds, and their love of idols was adultery in the Lord's sight. Both of these extremes that we're going to talk about this weekend is a worship, a worship of convenience or a worship of what I think people will think about me. Like, if I can make my kid successful, it'll make me look good. If my kid is happy, it'll make me feel good. If... I can push this away, then I don't have to worry about it. There are parents that treat their kids as if though their children are their bosses. And then there's, kids that treat, there's parents that treat their kids as if though they're their property. And your kids are not your boss and they're not your property. And yet that is, that is really the only two narratives that the world is telling us that we have. Man, and it's, it's heavy because nobody's speaking any truth about it. Now, as I said before in week number one, I'm going to try to say truth. I'm going to try to say it with some grace. So understand, if you've done some of these things, if you're actively erring on one side or the other, the parent who ignores their kid and misses out on opportunities to invest because your cell phone and your job and your priorities seem to kind of matter more to you, God's got hope for you. And there's something better for you. And if you're here and you're you, you, you've bowed down to everything that, you've, that your child wants and you've catered to them and you've followed the world's plan for what you think will make you look better, God's got better for you as well. If you've made these mistakes, don't sit here, don't sit here in shame and go, woe is me, I'm so embarrassed. Sit here and go, God, God allowed me to hear this message so I can do better. If, if, you've, if you're someone who has had an abortion, you're, you're welcome here I want you to understand that this, this church has made a point of saying we are all dumpster fires. Nobody is sitting here going, well, you shouldn't have done this. You, shouldn't. you have better with God in your future than you do staying and defending a mistake that you made in your past. And what I want you to hear is that all of us are guilty of sinning. All of us have fallen short of God's glory. And wherever you find yourself on this spectrum, know that God wants you to take a step towards him this weekend and and if you'll do that if somebody wants to judge you forget them they go pound sand they got their own journey to go on you just worry about what is god telling me to do okay and you're going to think a lot about all the other parents you know don't worry about the other parents you know you worry about you all right so let's talk about how, how this goes down the inconvenience part it is inconvenient to be responsible for somebody let me just say that to everybody it's like can't wait to be a parent <laughs> It's inconvenient. It will cost you time and money. Can you imagine if parenting was a job that you interviewed for? Hey, I'm applying for that open uh, position there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the parenting? Yeah, yeah. Uh, how, how long is it? Well, it's, it's a minimum 18 years. Oh, what's the pay? <laughs> you, you don't get paid. <laughs> but you're going to pay a lot. <laughs> Uh, cool, where are the perks? Uh, well, you'll be loved like crazy for maybe the first 10 years <laughs> and then resented through the teenage years. So get, get, look, get, get ready for that. 
Um, it's just, it, it, a lot of people don't, don't really stop to think about it. It, it, it. Let's just call it what it is. It, it can be very inconvenient. And not everything that God calls you to will be convenient. I'm tired of parents that pawn their kids off on the grandparents all the time because it's inconvenient for their plans. You had sex. You had a baby. You have responsibility. Is this on? I don't know. Two people are with me. Okay. Remember what the Bible says in Luke chapter 12, verse 48? Jesus is talking here. He says, hey, whom, when someone has been given much, much will be required in return. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even much more will be required. This goes right in hand with Jesus teaching about the parable of the talents. The master gives certain, he gives five talents to one of his slaves. He gives, five, he gives two talents to another, he gives one to another. And then he comes back to see how they did with their money. But the thing is, it's not their money. It's his money that he entrusted to them. Here's what you need to understand. Those of you that are living vicariously through your children, your children are not yours. Sure, there are many versions of you, but they're made in the image of God. They are his that he has entrusted to you to raise them to become the men and the women that follow after him. If you're trying to live through them or make yourself like, oh, this is all about them reflecting me, how my kids reflect me, and it matters. No, your job as a parent is how they reflect God. And this is where we're messing up. The, uh, <clears throat> I think a lot of it is, and listen, I'm guilty of this too, culture tells us that we are validated through our children. And in the same way when I talked about sexuality, you don't find your identity in your sexuality, you shouldn't also find your identity in your children. Guys, listen, I'm trying to set you free here. <laughs> this is not how, this is not, this is not at all anything you're going to hear from the world. This is nothing that secular uh, I- idealism is going to tell you. This is only something you're going to find in God's word. Your children shouldn't be the source of your validation any more than a boyfriend or a girlfriend should be, any more than your job should be, or your skill sets. As long as you keep trying to find your identity in those things, you will always be left empty. And by the way, those of you as parents that are trying to do this with your children, you're putting a pressure on your children that they can't live up to, that they will grow up and resent you for. Listen, I don't want to hear that, but that's true. Let's just, let's just call it out into the light and let's deal with this. All right? 1 Peter 5, 2 says this, Care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly. Yes, it's a responsibility, but if God's given you something to take care of, take care of it willingly, not grudgingly. Not for what you get out of it, but because you're eager to serve God. And then don't lord it over people that, you're, that are assigned to your care. Don't be, don't be a tyrant as a parent, but lead them by what? Who's good example? Your own. Your own, you have to step up to the plate and be like, watch what I do. Follow after me. There's a lot of parents saying, do as I say, but not as I do. We we wonder why our kids think we're full of it and want nothing to do with our religion, our beliefs, our value system. Because we don't believe it. We have a lot of talk, but not a lot of action. Didn't hear a lot of amens, but that's fine. I could not find the author of this quote, but something Kaylee said to me um, a while back, and I loved it, and a lot of people say that they're the first one to say it, but I couldn't find, it, find definitively who it was, but we are not raising children, we're raising adults. I love that phrase, because we get so wrapped up in this, they are my children, we forget that there's an end goal here. There's an end goal to parenting is that they become adults. Your job is to model guardrails for them so that when you are gone, they know where the guardrails are, not for you to corral them their whole life. Not for you to corral them their whole life. Is it any wonder that we've got grown men that are out there looking for a wife to replace their mom? Is it any wonder that we've got grown women out there looking for a husband to to, to fulfill their daddy issues? Because the parents haven't raised uh, 
up adults. They've just raised kids the whole time, and it makes them feel validated that their kids always want to hang on to them. Your job isn't for your kids to hang on to you when they turn 18 or 20 or 30. Your job is for them to become healthy adults that learn how to follow after God and do that in the best way possible, not make you feel good that they can't do anything without you. Well, I would never do that. <laughs> okay. I'm just, this is, this is not for you. This is for whoever else, you know, might hear this someday. Um, I'd also say this. I, I feel like there's a struggle here. The Bible talks about part of our job as parenting, parenting and leading the next generation is to create an environment that is absent of chaos. <clears throat> this is important because if you read the story of the prodigal son, when he's in the pigsty after he's rejected his father and his home and those values and everything, he turned his back on everything and he's out there. The thing that, that, that triggers his brain is that things are better than this back home. Under the rules and with the dad that I didn't really appreciate and the stuff I didn't like, the thing I wanted to get rid of my whole life, it's actually, there's, there's order and there's, there's a hope there. See, this is why God calls us as parents to set boundaries and consequences for breaking those boundaries. Because what you do when you create that, you, you are creating a place where you say, this is a, is a zone, this is an atmosphere, this is a home, this is a place that is absent of chaos. If you do whatever you want, if you, if you make the rules, now you've allowed chaos to come into this home. And now I can no longer provide for you a peaceful place. And that peace that you establish, even if it means you establish a hard consequence, it is still the, the environment that God uses to reel them back when they say, hey, I thought partying in the world, I thought pursuing all of my fleshly desires would be nothing but fun. But if I'm honest, and we all have had these moments, me pursuing my flesh has led me to sadness and disappointment, and shame, and guilt, and I wish I had a place of peace and calm, and I wish that there was more parents providing that. Problem is, we don't provide it. We demand it, but we don't provide it, because we're not, we're not living that way in our lives, but this is why Joshua gets up, and he says in chapter 24, verse 15, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, He's saying, hey, in this home, I can't control, honey, what your friends do. And I can't control what the neighbors do or what the kids on the bus talk about at their home. What I can control is what happens in our home. And as for our home, it will be a place that serves God. It will be a place known for the peace of God. It will be a place known for not what the world offers, but what, for what the king of king offers. And when I can say that, I, I'm, listen, I, I'm not trying to... I'm not trying to convince you that they will love that speech. <laughs> I did not love that speech, you know? Like, I'm not saying they'll be like, oh, I totally appreciate it. Thank you. They'll go, oh, but my friends, but literally everybody else. It's not your responsibility for everybody else. It's your responsibility for what God has given you, the talents that God has given you, the family, the home, the relationships that God has given you. You're responsible for what you do, not for what that friends' parents expect you to do or what culture tells you to do. This is where it hurts, though, because that, most, that, that requires over here not idolizing our children to the place that we worship them, but to the place where we lead them and say, hey, here's how it's supposed to be. And when you lead that way, the responsibility falls on your shoulders to not just talk a talk but walk a walk and then to follow that up with discipline. And discipline's got an ugly rap because it's so broken in culture. And some of you were disciplined very poorly as a child. Either you had no discipline or you had angry discipline. And biblical discipline isn't anger. It's love. It's correction with love, not correction out of exasperation. If you're exasperated, do not discipline 
Because you're not doing it from a place of, let me correct to help you be better. You're doing it from a place of, I'm so frustrated that I'm not having what I wanted, which is the kid that does what I want. I'm embarrassed because of what you've done. I'm angry because of what you've done. I'm depressed or I'm sad because of the money you're going to cost me or the thing that you've done. That is not how you discipline. You discipline from a place of love that says, I want better for you. And you are wandering too close to the edge of the cliff. So I will put up a guardrail. And like any good shepherd... You think that it's better over there, but I may have to chasten you. I may have to come and corral you back into the safe zone. Those who spare the rod, this is Proverbs 13, verse 24. Those who spare the rod of discipline hate their children. Oh, I don't hate my kids. Have you ever disciplined them? I don't hate them. The Bible says you actually do. The world and Satan has, has got this. He's like, you hate your kids if you discipline them. It's the direct opposite of what God says. If you love your children, you will actually put boundaries and consequences around them. That is not hate. That's the way you love them. It, if you spare the rod of discipline, you hate your children. Those who love their children care enough to discipline them. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, 6, direct your child onto the right path. And when they're older, they will not leave it. This is a hard verse, especially for those of you that tried your best and you have a prodigal right now. The verse does not say that they'll never leave it. It is implying that there will, even if there comes a time in their heart where they wander off the right path, you have set the hook in their heart. So that because of your example and because of how you poured into them, because of what you taught them, even though they wander away being stupid, <clears throat> wonder where they got that from, probably their parents <laughs> or their grandparents, just so I can hit everybody in here. <laughs> Even though they've wandered away, God can still reel them back in. Come on now. There's some of us that are in this room only by the grace of God and because somebody loved us enough to put that hook of God's best in our heart. And we wandered away, but at something, at some point in our life, reeled us back in. Some of you are here like, I still don't even know why I'm here. <laughs> like, Man, God, you, 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 as you got older, you didn't depart from it. I said this in that message that I talked about the an ordinary family, just for those of you that are taking notes, discipline is done to break their will, but not break their spirit. If you ever have a battle of wills with a little child, you understand what I'm talking about. They're sinners because they take after their parents and that will, that sinful will, that desire to do what they want. Yes. Even your precious angel has that sinful desire. I know some of you are like, not my kid. The teacher lies. <laughs> no, she's telling you the truth. Your kid's a brat. Your goal, your job as a parent is to break that sinful will without crushing their spirit. The goal isn't to hurt them. The goal is to be like, hey, listen, I'm, I'm glad that you got energy, but we don't take the energy that way. We do that this way. Like, you have to redirect it. Break the sinful will, but don't crush their spirit. Proverbs 29, 15 says... To discipline a child produces wisdom, but a mother is disgraced by an undisciplined child. That word disgrace is talking about shame. The shame falls on you when your kid grows up to be a jerk. Because you didn't train them. That's shame on the parents who never taught their child to be generous. Who never taught their child to tell the truth. Who never taught their child to think of others before they think of themselves. Those are things that you teach a child at the very beginning through their entire life. Not something you try to lecture them about when they're 20 years old. I didn't say people would enjoy this message. I just said I'd preach it. <laughs> Here's what I don't get. Some of you would never allow your children to play in traffic. You wouldn't. Duh, of course not. But you allow your kid to play on the internet. You would never let your kid sit down and drink a glass of bleach, but you let your, sit, your kid sit down and scroll TikTok and Instagram and Snapchat. Why is one poison okay, but the other isn't? Well, those are totally different. I get they're different, but the illustration still works. You're allowing one thing to kill your kid, but you're not going to let the other. You're, you're allowing Satan to get his hooks in your child in one area, and you're like, well, as long as I, as long as I look good to the, the PTA. Your kid could be going to hell in a handbasket and you look good on the surface the entire time. What really matters? Wow. Yeah. 
What really matters to you? What, what is, what's more important, that everybody else pats you on the back for being a good parent or that your, your child actually turns out well? And if you care more about how you look, it might be because you're in this camp where the kid is just an inconvenience for a few years. And if you're going, well, I'm just going to let them make up their own mind, that's also stupid. I love you, but when do you ever ask a child what they want? You're the adult. God has entrusted them to your care. You are the guardian. You are the gatekeeper. You are the filter on their life for the things they eat and the things they watch and the things they listen to and the people they hang out with, that is your responsibility. And if you're not doing it, it's because you've drifted too far over here. It is your responsibility to care for them. In the same way that I don't ask my little kids, hey, you know, do you wanna eat your vegetables? Of course they don't want to eat their vegetables. They want cake and ice cream all the time. But that isn't good for them, so I make them eat their vegetables. Same way I don't ask them if they want to go to school, they are going to school. I also don't ask them, parents, if they want to read their Bible tonight or if they want to pray, because this is what we are doing as a family. The same way I value you having vegetables and the same way I value you having an education is the same way I value you pursuing God. And it's my responsibility to demonstrate that. And some of you aren't doing it because you don't value it for you, so it's hard for you to fake valuing it for them. You want your kids to grow up with these morals and this character that you're not even working on yourself. And some of you that are in here that are young, you're like, oh, well, when I have kids, I'll start doing the right thing. You won't. You'll be too sleep deprived. (laughs) Start doing it now before you have the demand on your life to, to be pulled in a different direction. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, 11, no discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. That's for me, <laughs> and that's for every person who's ever been dis- Like, when God disciplines me, it's not enjoyable, and, and, and my kids don't enjoy being disciplined either. It's painful, but afterward, it's the discipline. It's the being told no. It's the bumping into a boundary And going, but I really wanted to walk closer to that cliff. And the boundary being an electric fence that shocks me back away from the dangerous cliff. It's in that moment, that painful moment of discipline, where God goes, no, Josh, you only think you want that. I'm saving you from a really big accident here, a really big problem. It's in that moment when I receive the discipline that I I can move on to a peaceful harvest of right living. But so many of us are so afraid to ever put the boundary because we worship our children more than we worship the God who created our children and and entrusted them to us. We care more about what Junior thinks more than we care about how God views our stewardship of his, his gift to us. Proverbs 1 says this in verse 8, My child, listen when your father corrects you, and don't neglect your mother's instruction. What you learn from them will crown you with grace and be a chain around your neck, a chain of honor around your neck. If you will listen, and by the way, there's no time cap on this. Oh, yeah. Did I fail to mention that? Your parents are your parents are your parents forever. And if, you, if you're blessed to still have parents that are alive, the Bible says honor your father and mother. And it doesn't give an expiration date on that. And I get some of you had some bad parents. It doesn't mean that everything your parents did is right. It doesn't mean that your parents are perfect. It doesn't mean that you even have to trust your parents on all these different areas. But you can still show honor and respect. Because I'm, gonna, I'm just going to tell you something. I've done enough counseling. The way you treat your parents they may very well be the way your children treat you. And they're watching. They're learning. Hey, how am I supposed to take care of an older parent? Let's see what dad does. Let's see how mom talks to her mom. Um, By the way, one of the things I've noticed in counseling a lot of couples that are either headed for divorce or struggling with it is that when they had kids, they changed from a marriage into an 18-year business arrangement, and that is not what God's called you to. Your children should leave one day, and your spouse should be there forever. 
Now, somebody needs to write that down. It is not about you maintaining the friendship with your kids over the relationship with your spouse. My kids know that if it comes to coming between me and mom, me and mom are in this together. You're a tenant that I don't charge rent to yet. <laughs> like, you're here and I love you, but this is forever, you know? Like, like we, we were together before you, and when you go on, and hopefully we raise you to be able to go on and, and be successful and do well, we're gonna, I still want there to be love and a relationship here afterwards. But so many people have just, their marriage, their entire marriage is just an arrangement to get their kids to college. That's why so many people get divorced as soon as they become empty nesters. Because there's no romance. There's nothing going on there. And if you're on that path right now, you need to acknowledge that and start working back towards the relationship you have with your spouse more than the relationship you have with your kids. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 20, verse number 12, honor your father and mother. Then you will live a long, full life in the land the Lord your God is giving you. The reward for honoring your parents is a full life. If you really love your kid and you want them to have a full life, teach them to honor you. And by the way, that means being somebody deserving of honor. I can't tell if you guys are all just like hating this message or if I should still keep preaching. So I'm just going to keep going. Colossians 3 verse number 20 says this, children, always obey your parents. This is what pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not aggravate your children or they'll become discouraged. That one's hard. You're like, okay, <laughs> I got to discipline them without aggravating them. Hmm. It's almost like when I take time to correct them, I also need to take time to show them that it's done, being done with love. How does my heavenly father correct me? He doesn't just lightning bolt me. He redirects me. He's like, Josh, I said no to your prayer request. It's not because I don't love you. It's because what you're praying for, you don't really want. And I see that. And so I've got something better for you. And God gracefully, mercifully, patiently walks with me through my stubbornness and my immaturity. Even if it means correcting me, it's always done in love. And if all you do is just correct and you never follow it up with anything else, you're not really fulfilling all that it means to be a parent. Fathers, don't aggravate your children. They'll become discouraged. Your goal should not be to discourage your child. Break their will, but don't break their spirit. A great passage for this, and you can study this more. Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents because, they be because you belong to the Lord, not because you belong to your parents. Because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother, no expiration date. This is the first commandment that comes with a promise. We already read that promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you. You will have a long life on the earth. And then it follows it up by saying, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Whether bring them up with discipline and instruction, what kind? That comes from the Lord. That begs this question. Would you allow Jesus... To raise your children now hold up think about how jesus would raise your children think about what he would be teaching them think about what the priorities would be there it would not be his priority to come home and sit down in front of the tv and zone out it wouldn't be his priority to make them like him all the time he would care about instilling in them the truth the instruction from the lord would be here is who you are, and you were made by a God that loves you, that has a specific plan for you, and everything about your life should be centered towards saying, God, how do I surrender more to you, become less of me and more of you? That is not the world's plan for raising children. You, you say, well, pastor, you're preaching to a church. I'm here. Of course I want my kids to know God and be raised, by, you know, raised with good morals. Great. How many conversations do you have with your kids about their surrender to God versus the conversations you have about their academics, their social life, their athletic prowess? You talk to your kids about a lot of things that you care about, and then you tell them to care about God. If you are faking it, you are doing more damage because your kids will see the hypocrisy in your spiritual life and they'll grow up to resent God and resent the church because you didn't really mean it you just 
sucked it up and toughed it out trying to hope they will get it. But they know what's real. And by the way, that counts for all the adults. You're sitting here going, well, this is just me. I want my kid to be influenced by you, but I want you to be somebody who is imperfect, who is a dumpster fire. I don't need you to pretend like you don't got issues. We all got issues. But I want you to be somebody who's honest about saying, hey, here's what it looks like to take a step forward. So even if it's not you with kids, what do other people see from you right now in your life? Are you cultivating the principles and the disciplines in your children, the ones that you want for them? So you imagine right now, make a list. I want them to be kind. I want them to be generous. I would like my future children to to be truthful. I would like my future children to have a walk with God. What are you doing in your life to instill that in you right now so that it is caught, not taught? So it is something that they just pick up from you. It's something that you, you just do and they just like, yeah, they didn't even have to tell me. I just see that in their life all the time. Now, let me, let me finish with this. <clears throat> I think some of you would hear this and say like, oh, you don't want my kid to be successful. I do. I want your kid to be successful. And if they play sports, great. And if they're a genius, great. And if they get a great SAT score, great. And if they're super popular and have a million followers on Instagram, fine. If that's what you want, okay. But if you're, if you're pushing them for academics at the cost of a relationship with God, what good does it do them to be a genius that, that misses out on heaven? And if you'll sacrifice taking your kids to church because the league that they're in plays on Sunday mornings, you're not telling them that God is most important. You're telling them that pursuing their physical abilities is the most important thing. And hey, man, they got that scholarship. They got that scholarship where they went to that school and partied with all those other kids that don't have a relationship with God. And then they literally turned into somebody who did not have any of the morals that you really wanted for them. Now, I'm not saying it's impossible. I know a lot of people who wicked smart, wicked athletic, and still love God. But that is a hard battle. And you are teaching your children who the God is in your life by where you prioritize. So be careful what you prioritize. You can have them be like insanely good at something. Take them to all the dance recitals that you can get to. Sweet. But make sure they understand that their, their ability to dance was something that God gifted them and that they can use that for his glory in their life, yeah. not just so they can win some trophies. <laughs> Guys, I think, it's time. I think it's time for us to end some generational curses. Amen. I want you to hear me. I think it's time that we end some generational curses. God, God does not want you to perpetuate the, the bad parenting that you received. Okay? And I understand in a lesson like this, some of you, you hear this, and all you can be reminded of is the lack of parents you had. You, didn't, you, had, a, you had a parent that was absent or very abusive. And it's hard to hear this kind of stuff. And maybe your parents were great, but they still made some mistakes and screwed you up. And the amount of counseling you're taking right now proves that, you know, you've got a lot to work through from some of the stuff that happened there. Okay, cool. We're all a little bit messed up, right? Just me? Okay, that's fine. Regardless if you had great parents or horrible parents, you can do better with the opportunities that God has given you. Learn from your parents' mistakes, whether that was a few or a, a bunch, and be better. You do not have to be the person that they were. You do not have to do it things the way they did. If you, even if you're not a parent, even if you'll never be a parent, then go back to this idea that whatever it is that God has for you, he's demonstrated the best parenting by describing himself as that, that parent that we need. He describes himself as both a father and a mother to us. In Isaiah 66, 13, he says, I will comfort you there in Jerusalem as a mother comforts her child. In the same way that a mom picks up a kid who falls and skins their knee and just wants to do nothing but love them, God says, that's, that's how I'm going to wrap you up. You got a hard day? I'm going to wrap you up and, and, and show you tenderness like a mom would. Jesus says in Matthew 23, 37, how often I wanted to gather your, chil your children together as a hen protects her chicks underneath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. 
He says, my, my heart's desire was just to be like a mama hen. Just put my wings out. Just let, let me protect you. That's, he's describing his heart. And he uses a picture of a mom to do that. That tenderness, that love, that care. That's what he would have for us, for our children. He says in, in 2 Corinthians 6.18, I'll be your father, and you'll be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. He refers to himself not just as a mom, but also as a dad. He says, he says in Hebrews 12, 5, Have you forgotten the encouraging words that God spoke to you as his children? He said, My child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline, and don't give up when he corrects you. He said, Listen, as the father corrects you, don't, don't rebel, don't push away, don't get mad. For the Lord disciplines those he loves. And he punishes each one he accepts as his child. And you say, well, I don't want any of that. No, no, no. That's a picture of love. Listen, I spent a lot of time in youth ministry before I became a pastor. I spent 15 years in, in, in children's ministry and youth ministry, uh, a decade here on the Cape. I had one of the largest youth groups in all of New England. And there's one thing, I, one thing I learned. One thing I learned is that those kids who had no parent in their life they were okay with the, with the discipline and the boundaries I put in their lives because they knew that I loved them. I had kids from all over, had no parents in their life, and when they'd show up, I'd say, here's the rules. Here's what you can and can't do. And nobody had ever told them that before. But then I also was like, I love you, and I'm here for you. And I'd take them, I'd give, you know, whatever I had to do, give them rides home, hang out with them, grab some pizza, whatever. They, they could handle the discipline if they knew that there was there was something behind it. Not a tyrant, but somebody says, hey, I love you enough to want better for you. And when I understand that that's the same way that God responds to me, man, it changes my whole view of scripture. It changes my view of what it is that God's trying to teach me. He, he disciplines those he loves. If you're feeling the discipline of, of God right now, don't push back on that as if though God's some kind of bully. Go, God, thank you for loving me enough that you care that I'm heading towards a cliff. Guys, I just said something that like I struggle with. I get mad at all the times that God tells me no because all I see is him keeping me from my fun. But when I understand that he's a, he's a dad that's saying I love you so much to protect you from things you can't see. The amount of times I've had to tell my kids no, not because I don't love them, but because I do love them. Because all I want for them is their safety and their health and something better. I have to take it on the chin when they don't appreciate that discipline. But I know it's what's best. And when I think about God doing that, how many times have I been mad at God, angry at his answers, and all he was doing was trying to love me? And then I think about how many times I screwed up. Some of you, you done messed up. There's some of you that, in this relationship, you think of your heavenly father relationship like you think of some of your earthly relationships. It's too far gone. Some of you, you had a dad who bailed. You've had a family member, maybe it wasn't a parent, but maybe it's a relative or somebody you love, and the bridge is burned and there is no return. And you haven't felt family love on a biblical level. See, this is what I love about Lamentations. The book of Lamentations says that God shows up fresh every day with new mercy. This is what it says. Great is his faithfulness, his mercy. Well, we'll switch it. I'll just read it from my Bible. It says, the faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His, his mercies begin afresh every morning. It doesn't matter how much my kids screw up. I love them. I love them and I want more for them. I'm not going to worship them, but I'm not going to ignore them either. I'm not going to idolize them, but I'm not going to be inconvenienced by them. That's what God models for me. He's not too busy for me, but he's also going to tell me the things I don't want to hear but need to hear. And when I can appreciate that, now my walk with God begins to be supercharged. And by the way, that understanding and that relationship with God helps me be a better husband. It helps me be a better father, a better friend. 
So maybe that's the lesson we need to learn. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. Let's pray together. And as we get ready to pray, I'd ask you to, to simply do a little heart check. What's your relationship like with your heavenly parent? The God who is nurturing like a mom, protecting like a dad. The God of the universe who says he's got a plan for your life that's better than any plan that you could have because he loves you more than you actually love yourself. Are you close to him or have you pushed him away? Are you a prodigal right now? Are you off doing your own thing? What about if in this moment you said, God, I, I didn't like to hear what I, what I heard, but I needed it. I, didn't want, I don't want to admit that I, I've made some mistakes, but I have, and I, I need you. And I, I've, I've gotten mad at your discipline. I've gotten mad at your correction, but I need it because I, I keep making dumb mistakes, and I, I need you more than I need me. Some of you need to have that conversation right now for the very first time. You need to invite Jesus Christ in and let him be your Lord and Savior. You need to let him sit in the driver's seat and allow him to be that shepherd, that driver of your life. That only happens if you will actually admit that you're messed up and that you can't fix yourself. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Bow your head and close your eyes. And why don't you pray quietly right where you're standing or wherever you're listening to this. Just simply say, God, I need you more than I need myself. God, you're a better God than I could ever be. I need that father that loves me. I need that correction that helps give me the, the boundaries. I need more of you. If that's, if that's a prayer that you're saying right now for the very first time, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will come to live inside of you if you truly mean it. It doesn't have to be those exact words, but if you will truly surrender in this moment, and say, I want Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I want to have a heavenly Father that I can call, that I can trust, that I can call on, that I can be close to. That's what I'm praying for. If that's you, there's never been a more important decision that you ever make. And while there's people praying that all around, there might be somebody in this room that says, I'm already a Christian. I'm already a believer. I'm already a follower. But have you rebelled? Have you turned away from God or are you actually actively right now saying yes, being surrendered to him? Do you really believe that he's got what's best for you? Maybe you just need to say, God, forgive me. Forgive me for pushing back. Forgive me for pushing away. I need more of you. And what if in this moment, God was trying to tell you that he wants more for you as a parent or as a grandparent? or as an influence on the people around you? Do you have the humility right now to say, God, forgive me? I went one way or the other. I've been one side or the other. I, I, I've, I've come up with excuses for why I'm too busy or too afraid to do the right thing. God, I need you. As I pray out loud, you pray quietly and just do work. Just do some business with God. Ask him to make sure that you walk out of this room different than you walked in. Maybe committed to be more honest. Committed to try a little harder. Committed to be a little bit stronger. More structured, more hopeful. More ready to serve, ready to love, ready to forgive. More patient. Whatever it is you need, God has it for you. Find it at his feet. As I pray, you pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you for who you are. God, thank you for loving us. God, thank you for giving us the opportunity to know you better. God, thank you that we can not only see how to be better parents, but God, we can see that you are the perfect parent. You are the, the God who loves us unconditionally and loves us too much to let us make dumb, dumb mistakes without at least providing us better guardrails. God, you've given us truth and you've given us a plan and we've often screwed it up. God, I know I'm guilty of pushing back and rebelling against your best. Lord, would you help each and every one of us that are guilty of that right now to find forgiveness at your feet? God, some of them right now, they need to find you as a savior. They need to accept you and invite you in as their Lord. 
They need to receive that free gift that you've given all of us, which is a forgiveness of sin and a relationship with you. God, help each and every one of us know that. Let us walk out of this room. Let us end this service knowing that we can be better, knowing that you've got better for us, for our children, for our parents, for for our future. God, let us get excited about how you have more for us than what we could ever hope for ourselves. God, let us trust you more. Let us be excited about what it is you want to do in our lives. We thank you and we praise you and we believe all of this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.